it's my pleasure to kind of dive in and talk about why Data Mesh, what is it about, and where are we with it in 2023? I first pondered the idea and talked about it before it had a name back in 2018. It was called Beyond the Lake, and now we are in 2023, and I could not possibly imagine at that point that this would become the next kind of uh, trend in uh, big data management for AI and analytics. So let's, with that, let's dive in. Um, as I was introduced, I am the CEO and founder of Next Data. We are a technology company. We are reimagining the developer, data developer experience, building data products and creating a data mesh. And uh, for your uh, access, I have also included two URLs that you can get access to two of my books for free, for a limited time on O'Reilly platform. So the reason Data Mesh was created, and that remains to be true because we're at a moment in time that the organizations feel to be at an inflection point. The, the purpose behind Data Mesh was this observation addressing the problem that organizations, as they were growing, as they were becoming more complex, the use cases for data were proliferating, right? Any aspect of your business can be improved by automated decision-making using data. But as, but as these use cases were growing, the number of sources of the data were growing, aspirations for data-oriented kind of decision-making and automation was growing, the impact, the business impact was actually plateauing. Um, we couldn't really change as quickly. We couldn't respond to the market as quickly as possible. Uh, we couldn't get the cost of managing data keeps growing. I mean, I talked to a lot of um, CDOs and CTOs, and I know that how many millions of dollars we're investing to just maintain the base infrastructure for managing data. So, so all of that combined really was the genesis behind data mesh as an idea that we need to have a method or model that as the organization grows, the value that we get from data grows. So in step with organizational growth, we can see an impact of the data. And the reality really, this is, this is an unchanging reality and slightly changing over time, uh, that is depicted by New Vantage Partner Survey that they've been running for 11 years, uh, 11 or 15 years, in fact, uh, that the investment in data and AI is increasing, rapidly increasing, like 99% of all companies that they survey, they do invest in data and AI. More than half of them are investing uh, 50 million and above in their data uh, infrastructure and AI. But the outcome that we're getting is disproportionately kind of um, small, as in less than half of the companies or less than a lot less than half of the companies are competing on data and becoming data driven. So the transformational impact of the money that we are spending is not really that noticeable. And the reason for that is that one of the reasons that I chose to, I guess, invest my life the last few years is to look at what is going on, what is causing this plateauing, what is causing this high spend, low result uh, outcome. And the reason is because where we've been in the evolution of technology, we had some hard problems to solve around the scale of data, right? We had to suddenly manage a large amount of data with the Hadoops of the world and distributed file systems and so on. We had to put a lot of energy in managing the scale of variety of the data with time series data, structured, unstructured, blob storage. We had to put a lot of energy in managing the, the scale of velocity of the data with the backbone of streaming and the nervous system, you know, of your basically data system. But now it's time to really bring that focus and attention to the scale of the complexity of organizations. We no longer live in a world that you can have a BI team to really manage a few reports in a warehouse. We are in a world that every single you know, developer, technologist, business person needs to have access to data to do something valuable with it, right? At the speed of the market. So the current paradigm from the technology and team structure perspective, really, um, I know cartoonishly displayed in this diagram looks like this, right? You've got your kind of 
perhaps some degree, high degree of digitization happened on the left-hand side of this diagram when you have your app to pizza teams, app developer teams, digital teams. And on the right-hand side, many times in your business domains, you have analysts or data scientists that are trying to use data to move the needle on the efficiency, effectiveness, and the impact of that business unit. But in the middle sits the data team whose job is move data from A to B, whose job is create data pipelines, move data to data lake and warehouse. And then once it's there, create metadata and create catalogs and semantic definitions so that data can be discovered, understood, and accessed. And that creates a very fragile system. It creates a bottleneck in the middle that as your organization left and right grows, it becomes more and more, you know, becomes a slower and becomes uh, under pressure, a fragile set of pipelines, long lead time to value. And though I depicted the current world, the kind of the modern data stack or the, you know, the, the, the previous generation of data stacks as this kind of cute, cartoonish diagram, but the reality is even darker than that, and that is the fact that many of these technologies and tools that we work don't have standards to integrate nicely together. So I talk again to, to a lot of folks that have gone down the path of, okay, let's, you know, let's buy some, you know, workflow management systems or um, data pipelining systems and some warehouse and tag along some catalog and an integration of all these technologies together is actually a very hard task. What I've tried to depict here, I think the analogy that comes to mind is this Tower of Babel, uh, which is as a human race, we have the highest level of ambitions to build this tower that reached the heavens, but we don't actually speak the same language we don't have standards established. So what we end up building, beautifully depicted by this Flemish painter, this thing that is barely hanging together and is falling apart. And a lot of the effort, a lot of the time of folks are spending, um, spent on maintaining this. Uh, there is a old kind of, um, 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 estimation that has been, the statistics that have been, you know, um, uh, shared by Gartner that 84% of the data initiatives fail, and some of it is because they have these big ambitious plans of reaching heavens without having the right tools and standards. So, so really, data mesh paradigm came to exist to unlock and tackle this complexity of organizations when they're faced with data, right? data for analytics, data for ML. And fundamentally, the target kind of architecture, the target operating model we want to get to with Data Mesh is essentially repeating what we already did with APIs and services and say, well, the same way we democratize and decentralize and interconnected capabilities of the business through services and APIs, why can't we do that with big data. Of course, big data has a lot of different challenges we have to address. It's not simply you build data services. It's very different, but fundamentally it's the same paradigm. So you have your cross-functional domain teams that are currently managing some applications. And now in the new model, they're also managing all the structural components, everything that is needed to serve data as a product which means if I am in an e-commerce team, I am managing, you know, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm providing return on investment uh, metric or data product, I'm managing the pipeline, the code, the data, the model of the data, the metadata, all of that for return of investment. And I am in the e-commerce team, the long-term ownership of that data, and I have access to a new generation of technology to help me build shared data product without having three PhDs in data management, right? So that requires then a new set of ways of standards for data sharing at scale. So if somebody wants to run an analysis on return of investment, as well as you know, customer growth, as well as expansion to different regions and different data products, they can interconnect these analytical kind of APIs together. They can federate it in a federated way, get access to the data, use it. So while that is the target architecture and operating model we want to get to, when I started describing data mesh, I really wanted to find the first principles and apply this first principle thinking to 
what are the principles we need to adhere to for that target kind of picture to come to life? And essentially, there are four principles of data mesh. And what I would love to share with you is the reason behind them, maybe the backstory and why they came to exist, and the current state of them. Where are we with them? Really, the most important pillar is about the domain ownership. And if you think about what it, why we say people in the domains need to own and share their data is because we need to have a model that scales out and doesn't have a central point of failure, doesn't have a central bottleneck. So what does that look like? Um, I want to give, again, an example. It's a little bit of a fictional example, but without imagination. It's made out of my imagination, but without imagination, we go nowhere. So go back. let's go back to that e-commerce retail kind of scenario. Many of you like Zalando as a retailer. You can imagine maybe this is a fictional Zalando. Uh, but uh, you basically have these uh, domain-oriented teams. These are business-oriented first teams that have a business outcome, like e-commerce would be, you know, the outcome would be growth through the digital channels. The retail group would be growth perhaps through retail channels. Um, the logistics and shipping would be about, you know, efficiency and reliability of moving products from source to destination. All of these business units have folks that are, taking care of applications, the digital systems, as well as now data products. So that e-commerce team, perhaps, um, uh, let's say they are providing their digital, they have digital channels on their own website and on other websites. In this particular retailer, unlike Zalando, perhaps, <laughs> they are selling their products on their website and on Amazon and a few other uh, digital channels. So they are providing sales information, sales data as data products um, across all of their regions, across all of their products, across all of their sales as data products to the rest of the organization. And there is no data team. There is no middleman. There is no central bottleneck because if I'm in a shipping team and I need to know something about how the digital channels are selling or what the digital channels are selling or how fast the customers are growing on the digital channels and I need to adapt my shipping kind of algorithms and process, I can directly discover all of the data products provided by e-commerce and I can directly get access to them and I don't need to put a backlog item on anybody's central team backlog to give me data about sales. And that's really the heart of this domain ownership. You can see how this model can grow over time. But if we just did that and we did nothing else, the very first problem that you have to solve is that your data might become silo. E-commerce team might be just capturing a ton of good information about digital sales. Nobody can find it. Nobody can understand or use it. So that we're back to data siloing problem. So the second pillar is really an antidote to that. Data as a product was a concept, a principle, but that was developed to say, let's treat these data sets that we're generating, the, the code that is managing that data, the metadata that helps discover and understand the data, let's package all of that together, let's maintain that all as one artifact, and let's serve it in a way that the users, data analysts, data scientists, everyone in between can easily discover, can easily understand, they can address it and use it natively in the way they use. They can interoperate and interconnect it to other data products. It is secure and it's valuable. So I put eight characteristics around this humble hexagon and they call the DAV units and essentially was about, first and foremost, what are all of the little pieces we need to put together, which is more than just the data, for this thing to be timely, for be alive, for, be redu for it to create data that is relevant today and it's not stale, that's code. What else we need to put in there for people to actually understand what this is about and trust it? Well, it needs to have metadata to say how when it's getting generated and when was the last time and who owns it and who is even using it, how it can be used so it can be trusted and understood. So it needs a lot of metadata and documentation and again, computational documentation, perhaps like Jupyter notebooks and so on. 
And of course, it needs the data itself. And that data served through APIs that are multimodal so that if somebody wants to run a SQL, they can do that. And if somebody wants to run you know, a training machine learning model, they can do that as well. And luckily, the underlying storage technologies that we use are converging to support this native access by the type of the usage nicely. So that was really the purpose of the second pillar, I think, where we are in the industry today in 2023. I think data product has found a life of their own, uh, even independent of data mesh, and there are many different interpretations of it. I had a very, I guess, um, strong opinion on, on, on what really makes a good data product and, and did some root cause analysis that the separation of pipelines from the actual data was the root cause of a lot of discrepancy that happens between the two and the lack of ownership of the two as one unit. So uh, the definition of the data product that was defined, um, that I defined and put in the book, really included more than just the data itself. Um, and I think where we are today is really, we're still figuring out and norming on what does data product mean? And there are many vendors are becoming data product management tools, whether they're catalogs or you know, query engines and so on. So we, we're seeing some progress, but uh, we still have a way to go. On this, uh, the, if you imagine, okay, we said domains own their data. It's not just data, it's data as a product. They have to fully manage the life cycle of this thing. Now, the problem that arises is that a company needs to hire probably And uh, maybe we can have our technicians give me a sign as to... It's a little bit misunderstood. The part that we all understood what it means is what we know what platforms do, right? Platforms abstract complexity. Uh, and a lot of organizations where they are today, they say, okay, if you want to build a data product, you probably have to build some data pipelines. You've got to store your data somewhere. You've got to store your metadata somewhere else. And then you've got to give access to policies in yet another tool. And here you go, kitchen sink of tools to use to your build your data products. And that is why that is great. We have some automations and uh, around some of these cross-functional capabilities like metadata management and cataloging and you know data pipelining, that's great, but really that is too low level for where a generalist data hacker, domain specialist needs, right? So the where we are in 2023, I think we've got a lot of great tools that do different functions, like the function of catalog, the function of warehouse, the function of lake storage, but we really still missing that developer first data product oriented experience of building, sharing, connecting data products as a first class concept. I think that's still a missing piece. And what I see is that a lot of organizations internally invest in building their own uh, version of this platform. And finally, the fourth principle, in fact, is, is federated computational governance. And in fact, when I first wrote the very first article back in 20, published it in 2019, I didn't have this pillar there. And in governance was like a little, just a, a line under the data product, data as a product. It was that, oh, well, your data product needs to be secure, clearly. It needs to have some standards. But very quickly, I realized that really the, to, for this ecosystem to work, we need to reimagine governance. The governance as it is today, or as it's been evolved over the last many years, it's a very rich um, function, and it's fundamentally necessary for organizations. You want to have the right data available to the right people at the right time, right? But how to get there right now is very centrally the, the function has been centrally defined and centrally managed, and that becomes a point of synchronization, ultimately a bottleneck. So you've got all these wonderful data teams running around in their domains and building data products, but you need a, if you need a centralized team to govern that, that's almost impossible. So the, there were two ideas behind federated computational governance. The, one of the ideas was to automate 
policies as code. And again, this is a discipline and practice in architecture and technology software development that we had to adopt. The moment that we went from monolithic applications behind firewalls to distributed services across, you know, 10 different clouds and SaaS products, we had to introduce zero trust architecture and automate policies. Now it's a moment to do that for data. So where we are with that. So if you think about policies, policies including retention, um, access control, um, privacy, regulations, all these policies impact code and data, impact who can access data, impact when you write the data, what, what you need to encrypt or don't encrypt. And right now, the only way really these policies are implemented are implemented at your storage level or at the compute level today storage, right? Simple as grant statements on your SQL tables, right? And unfortunately, there is no general kind of higher level standard for policies as code that then different proprietary vendors can adopt and apply. Unlike OpenID Connect, unlike OAuth, unlike JOT, unlike a lot of policies that were defined for computational services and internet in general, right? That is a missing piece in, in, the, in the world of policy for data. And as a result, what has happened is that there, there is a numerous, there's a whole catalog of vendors most of them proprietary and some of them open source that try to do this mapping, mapping of some, you know, kind of proprietary definition of policy into pushing down those policies into the underlying proprietary or open kind of storage and compute. And for the data mesh to work, we need to have a standard policy. So if you're implementing right now, you're probably subjected to a proprietary way of defining policies and encode them in your data products. So uh, that was the premise of the four pillars. That's where we want to get to. Where are we with the market? So I think data mesh really has captured the imagination of the market. It's been a growing trend. I keep an eye on the kind of Google Trends anal uh, analysis this year in one of the you know kind of largest AI data summits. There were two words out of the leaders like the innovation leaders or technical leaders of large organizations at least in us and one of them was gen ai and the other one was data products right so so there's parts of it that is just, this is really capturing the imagination from the largest enterprise in the world the largest enterprise in the world is the department of defense in the us they are adopting principles of data mesh to a lot more digitally savvy and uh, you know, organizations across the world, some of which Zalando, HelloFresh, I put their, their names here. So it is an absolutely growing trend because people have hope that it really solves the bottleneck of the data that they have. There is a community around it, which I encourage you to join, Data Mesh Learning. There is a Slack, meetups, podcasts, uh, a very active learning community, and it's managed by a foundation. of an existing technology. So, uh, Shamek, so if I can stop you just for one second. We sometimes lose Sorry. you for 10 seconds. Your count dials back oh. in. The last thing we heard this time was podcast. If you can just rewind for 15 seconds and take it from there again. <laughs> I am really sorry for that. This is uh, not fun for you. <laughs> I am really sorry. So please pause me. I'm not sure what's causing this. I'm, I'm running the team in browser. Maybe that, that is why, but uh, let's try again. So yes, so there is, there is a big uh, data mesh learning uh, community led by a foundation uh, that provides podcasts, newsletters, meetups, and also a lot of surveys. So survey you know, organizations that are on the journey of data mission, they're, they're sharing their uh, findings and results. So this, they definitely tune in to the Data Mission Learning Foundation. Um, vendors, of course, we have a spectrum of vendors that are implementing data mesh mostly as a feature. So if you have a catalog, 
a lot of catalogs change their kind of structure to be more domain oriented or have domains if you had you know, federated query engines, they're adding metadata to use to define data products. If you had, um, you know, um, a big warehouses, they're creating marketplaces that uh, shows single facade of kind of data mesh. But most of the vendors that the changes we see are more still, I would say, superficial changes that um, are features, right, added to the existing technology that existed. So are we there yet? If you ask me, I'm the, I'm the worst person to ask, are we there yet? Because I have such high ambitions around change and this future where data and AI can be empowered by decentrally owned and responsibly shared data. So I'm the worst person to ask. So if you ask me, I would say we well, still have a way to go. And, and the reason for it is I always go back to the definition of data mesh that I introduced in the book, which is a socio-technical approach for changing the way we share, access, use data for analytics and AI to be more decentralized, to be more responsible across organizations, across environments. And data sharing at that level, at the global level, across organizations, platforms, clouds, is still an issue. So we're not quite there yet. And as we get there, there are some patterns and some anti-patterns are developing. So I want to talk to some of these and perhaps give some guidance as how you can kind of maybe work around them and find your way toward damage. So when you think about, when I look at the spectrum of organizations that are adopting data mesh, <clears throat> excuse me, data mesh initiatives uh, often starts in two places, in one of the two places or both. And it's these two places are two places with people with most pain or highly incentivized. So either data mesh implementations or evangelism in an organization ignites from the centralized data team because the CDO, CDAO is under a lot of pressure. They cannot possibly deliver to the demand of the data users and the growth of the data sources. And everybody on left and right, just on the left, the data sources really don't care. The data users are always frustrated. And the CDO says, that's it. We need to move to a data mesh model. In that case, in this first case, because the initiative is done centrally at the top, outside of the domain, what happens is it just stays there. And ultimately, the purpose, the purpose of data mesh is empowering the domain teams, and domain teams are not empowered because the technology and tooling that is suitable for centralized, specialized data engineers are very different to what the domain teams need to be able to achieve the same outcome, but with a lot less work and specialization in data. So that's one anti-pattern. So if you are a CDO or CDAO or somewhere in a centralized data team want to move to this mode, you need your allies and your first evangelists and innovator adopters at the hip connected with you from the domains and start with the domains. The other pattern that I found, which is a bit more promising in my mind, is that data mesh starts by people who have, are most incentivized because they are in the business domain and to get their job done, to have the impact they need to have, they need to have access to not only have access to data from many different places, but also they, they provide data for others to use. So they're both consumers of the data and producers. As an example, let's imagine you are a pharmaceutical pharmaceutical company. We have a large pharmaceutical customer, early customer right now, and the, their domains in a drug create medicine creation include clinical research, drug discovery, drug manufacturing, um, approval. There's a whole lot of domains. And in the drug discovery, as an example, you have people with three PhDs in chemistry and medicine and a lot more, and very, very smart, intelligent people. They hack with data, like they reuse a bit of R script and some maybe Python and some, you know, commands, shell commands here and there. They hack their way through. They need data from clinical research and other domains, and they provide what they find the, the, the drug discover to get commercialized and manufactured and approved 
So they're stuck in the middle to do their job. They're desperate for good data. They're desperate to understand and discover their data. They're under pressure to provide data to other folks. They are most highly motivated. So sometimes in, uh, data mesh actually starts within domains. And I'm really excited about those cases because those are the people that are most motivated to change their behavior. They're in so much pain, they can't do their job, and they're directly, their work directly impacts the business. Their work is not move data from left to right. This directly impacts the business, right? So I think that's where really um, the most engagement that happens. And if you are an organization that are changing data mission, I think finding the, those domains and starting from there is the right place. And there is also, there, as, as you think about this organizational change and who owns data, I think there is a few key pieces that you can start playing with to create that change. And one of those key pieces, is, of course, is incentives, aligning kind of incentives of what how people get rewarded with data mesh, as in creating the roles of data products, incentivizing those roles based on the satisfaction of the users of the data, based on the growth of the users. Uh, the other piece that you can apply is this inference Conway's maneuver, which is about really changing your architecture first to, to mimic the team structure that you want and the team forms around it. So start pulling out perhaps aspects of your data that is in your lake and or warehouse and it's managed currently centrally and linked to the other all the P data pieces and creating a data product around that piece and separating the interfaces and APIs to it, and then you know, get, getting a domain team organized around it. And finally, I think really the most fundamental shift that I hope with the Gen AI and the likes of large language models is going to happen very fast is embedding data science and embedding analytics in the domain themselves. The same way that we embedded app developers or aligned app developers with the business and technology became part of the biz dev ops, right? So you had business and development and operations as part of one team, biz dev data ops, like all of that need to be part of the same team. And that's that's where the intrinsic motivation happens, just like the scientists that I just described, right? From the technology front also, I think there we have a little bit way to go because as I said, either data mesh has become Well, it's good to know that Germany is not the only country with a <laughs> with a patchy internet connection, but so is the Silicon Valley. Who would have thought? Um, Jamek, we lost you when you started sharing that slide. So if you can just rewind exactly, and when you jump from that slide to the next slide, we lost you. If you can just restart there, that would be awesome. Thank you. Here? Here? Yes, slide? exactly. Okay. Okay, so on the technology front, uh, what we are seeing is that the data mesh enablement is happening on, it is happening, but it, there are limitations. So as an example, uh, cloud providers are providing data mesh as a single pane of glass on top of their technology stack. And as long as you are on that cloud provider, you can have a flavor of data mesh. So on your GCP, you get data place on AWS, you get data zone and so on. But between clouds, there's still no solution. Or if you're on a single platform, if you're on Snowflake, you get their flavor of data mesh. If you're on database, you get their flavor of data mesh. So it's single kind of platform flavors of data mesh. Or in case of people building their own version, sometimes I see that data mesh happens too late or data product sharing happens too late to downstream. So data product becomes a something that you generate off the back of your lake in a catalog. 
and that's too late. So all of these have their own limitations and they're not fundamentally solving the, the, the core issue, which is centralization of responsibility and empowering data hackers, whatever we want to call these folks that really want to work with data, but they don't have three PhDs in data, data engineering, right? So how do we solve for the technology? I think really the if you are thinking about how do I bring technology to life in a way that I change behavior in my organization, I think first and foremost, you need an end-to-end -end kind of an experience, a new experience, a new developer experience, data product developer experience that enables peer-to-peer -peer on one end, creating, connecting, sharing, and on the other end, discovering, understanding, and using. You need to think about your APIs for discovering data products, for understanding data products, and then getting access to the lake underneath or data warehouse underneath. Um, you need to codify this concept of a data product as one unit, the code, the everything that needs to be versioned together, the model of your data declared together, the metadata that constitutes one data product to build an experience around. And then there are some hard limitations that is really out of your hands is your technology providers that need to change. And I think that's already happened. And I'm really excited about that. I remember the very first data mesh implementation that I created had had hard limitations. We could have only a dozen kind of lake storage accounts on a particular cloud. And so that you could only have a dozen you know, data products. Like I mean, a dozen is just a nominal number. It was probably 120 to 100, but nonetheless, a limited number. Or we didn't have across account data sharing for a while, and AWS, for example, uh, introduced it last year or the year before. So I think some of these hard limitations are being removed, but fundamentally experience remains to be developed. And that's why, I guess, I personally, I couldn't stand aside and just wait for someone to do it. And that's why I changed my kind of trajectory in my own life and started next data to really codify this concept of a data product as a container and build an experience around it for easily and declaratively building, sharing, and connecting and discovering data products. I think we are at a very, very exciting point in time where you know that we all have this hope and vision for this future that data is more distributedly shared and responsibly shared and ownership of the data remains with the people that really are best positioned to be custodians and long-term owner of it. I think the vision is there, the pain is there, the demand is there, and there is a white space for innovation and you can innovate wherever you are. If you are an organization adopting it or if you're a tool maker building tools, and with that, um, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. And look at that, I finished shop at 7.40.